Hi everybody, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. In video E of the integumentary system, we finally get started on the accessory organs of the integumentary system. Remember that the integumentary system consists of the skin and accessory organs, and they include, as listed here, your hair follicles, the nails, our sweat glands, which have a fancier name, pseudoriferous glands, and the oil glands, also called the sebaceous glands. These are all derived embryologically from the epidermis, and they're mostly located in the dermis. So on, on pictures, on slides, you'll see that they are located mostly in the dermis. Now also in the dermis, we find sensory, I'll just put D for dermis, sensory receptors, but of course they belong to our nervous system. So they're not truly part of the integumentary system, but they are present there. Let's start with hair follicle anatomy. So if we take a look at our skin as shown here, with the epidermis, the dermis, and then the subcutaneous layer or the hypodermis, we see that hair follicles are pretty deeply embedded in the, in the, uh, ep in the dermis, I should say, even all the way into the hypodermis. And this rather swollen part we'll refer to as the hair bulb. As a matter of fact, most of what is embedded into the skin we'll refer to as the root of our um, hair follicle. And then the part that sticks out, they've labeled it as part of the epidermis here, um, but really mostly the part of the hair follicle that sticks out we call the hair shaft. Now let's take a closer look at the hair shaft and um, learn what kinds of layers are present here. The inner core of a hair follicle, this white layer right here, the inner white layer, we'll refer to as the medulla. And we're going to see this term in anatomy over and over and over again. The medulla always refers to the very inner core of an organ. The medulla of the spleen, the medulla of a lymph node, um, we have the medulla of the, or the medullary cavity, basically the medulla of long bones. So we'll see that term over and over again, along with cortex. And the cortex will usually cover or surround, I should say, the medulla. So in our hair shaft case, that is the dark brown layer. Now in the hair follicle, we see superficial to the cortex, the cuticle. And it's the layers, or I should say the cells, of the cuticle, and these are of course all keratinocytes, that get damaged as our hair grows longer. And so we like to cut our hair to remove those hair follicles with damaged uh, cuticles. In the deeper portions of the hair, nearby the hair bulb, we see that the hair follicles cuticle layer begins to disappear, maybe even most of the cortex, and it starts to get replaced by this green layer and beige layer. Both of these are still all keratinocytes, because the hair follicle is mostly made up of keratinocytes that produce keratin that is actually a tougher keratin that, than the keratinocytes of your skin. And this green layer and beige layer collectively are called our root sheath. And so the inner layer is called the inner root sheath, or, and we could be more specific and say the inner epithelial root sheath. And then we have the outer epithelial root sheath. Now superficial to that, in the white here, we have yet another layer, which is not labeled here, so I'm going to add it for you guys. And that is the connective tissue, or yeah, the connective tissue sheath. So we have a sheath of epithelial tissue, and we have a sheath of connective tissue. This microscope slide shows you a cross section of a hair follicle or a transverse section. And in this particular image, we see that the, the hair has fallen out, so there is no 
hair located inside of our hair follicle. But deeper in the follicle, we still see our, um, our epithelial root sheath, followed by our connective tissue root sheath. And we very clearly see the basement membrane, I have labeled it here, which in hair follicles is often referred to as the glassy basement membrane. I'm sorry if you hear my dog nearby. <clears throat> now just like the keratinocytes had to be fed by the capillaries of the dermis via the dermal papillae, we see that there is a dermal papilla that helps feed our hair follicle. So there is an invagination right here of the dermis into the hair follicle. We call that the dermal papilla again, and it's very crowded with a capillary bed or capillary beds. And they're going to especially feed that layer, that basal layer of cells right nearby the dermis here. And that is actually what is the hair matrix. So I'm not particularly crazy about where they labeled the hair matrix. The hair matrix is really the basal layer that touches the dermal papilla. And that is also where we see lots of mitotic divisions, just like we learned in the skin. We also find in that basal layer quite a few um, melanocytes, and of course they're going to help give your hair its color. If we continue to look at the hair bulb, and now focus actually on this uh, picture here. This picture has a lot of interesting structures and we'll continue discussing them as, as we move on with our videos. But as we um, stay focused on our hair follicle here, the hair bulb is typically going to have an innerv innervated part that we need to study. It's not shown on this picture but it is shown here and I have blown it up over here. So this is our hair bulb here with its various layers. You can see very nicely here the dermal papilla once again. And so all of these yellowish fibers that you see here that literally hug our hair follicle are the beginning of a sensory neuron. So they are the beginnings of a sensory neuron. And as the name says, well, let's just write this down for a moment before we add more information. And the beginnings of a sensory neuron always function as a sensory receptor. And the name of this particular sensory receptor is going to be the root hair plexus. So what I just pointed at, all of these yellowish fibers, they start a sensory neuron. So the beginning of a sensory neuron is very branchy and that functions actually as a sensory receptor. We call that sensory receptor a root hair plexus. So let's say a little uh, bug is crawling on you which is pushing against your little hair follicles. The movement of the hair follicles is detected, is sensed by this root hair plexus, is sensed by this beginning of this sensory neuron. And consequently, we're going to see that electrical signals are going to be sent down this sensory neuron towards our central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord, particularly the spinal cord first, and then eventually the brain. Now, in response to this bug crawling on us, you've, you might have noticed that sometimes our hair might stand up, and that is due to the fact that there is a little smooth muscle attached to our hair follicle, and you see that right here. This smooth muscle we refer to as the erector pili muscle. Notice that it's spelled with starting with the letter 
um, A and not an E. So the erector pili muscle, which is a smooth muscle. This is important for you to remember. It's not a skeletal muscle. It's certainly not a cardiac muscle. Um, and it is innervated by a branch of the autonomic nervous system we call the sympathetic uh, nervous system. So let's say a few words um, with th about that and allow me to um, jot down some notes for you here. So there is a branch of the nervous system called the autonomic nervous system not automatic, but autonomic. And it has two branches itself, or two sub-branches, called the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. You may have learned to call our sympathetic nervous system as our fight or flight system. And what that means is this is the nervous system that kicks in when you are extremely scared, when you have to run for your life or you have to fight and really try to save your own life. You feel your sympathetic nervous system kick in when you've just almost gotten into a very bad car accident. That's when, that's a really good example. We, we all drive more, I'm, I'm sure, and we've all experienced that to the point that we may feel the back of our, the, the, the neck hairs stand up. Or you might have noticed your neck hair standing up when you see something uh, really gruesome or um, I don't know, you might have experienced the proximity of a bear, for instance, or you might not have experienced that yet. Sometimes it doesn't happen or you don't recognize that, that it happened to you until later in life. And so it is your fight or flight nervous system, or better called your sympathetic nervous system, which has other neurons, other nerve cells that we call motor neurons that innervate that erector pili muscle to contract. So if I add the sympathetic motor neurons to my muscle cell, my smooth muscle cell, I, I'll do it like this. And this time, again, I'll call it a motor, sympathetic motor no neuron. This time, our electrical signals are traveling towards our little muscle from the CNS, right? So the CNS is sending out its commands in the form of electrical signals, and the electrical signals are now going towards our effector. I'm hoping that you're remembering your homeostatic control mechanism. So the hair, the root hair plexus, it senses the environment while or the beginning of a sensory neuron senses the environment while motor neurons, they're going to stimulate effectors to do something. And in this case, um, contraction of our erector pili muscle. Finally, we see that our hair follicles are also associated with oil glands very often or sebaceous glands, and we will study those in a bit. So here we see a nice big microscope slide of a hair follicle right here. It actually has a hair in it. It has kind of a goldish look to it right here. Often when you look at hair follicles on slides, they may not have a hair in it. It may have lost its hair. We all lose our hair on a daily basis. These big cloud looking like structures are oil glands that we're going to study in another video. And these very long skinny reddish structures that directly connect to the hair follicles. We see this one here. This one goes to another hair follicle, this one too. Those are your erector pili muscles. And then we'll also soon learn here about the various sweat glands that we find in the integumentary system. The functions of our hair are pretty obvious. Clearly, uh, our hair protects us against uh, any kind of friction and 
uh, the loss of heat, it also protects us from too much heat from the sun, for instance, and UVV ra radiation, even uh, from insects. And it's a nice, it, our hair can form a nice insulation layer, again, therefore protecting us from um, getting too cold. And we find hair follicles pretty much all over the body, except for the bottoms of our feet and our, the palms of our hands and also our lips, including our nipples and portions of our external genitalia. So those are some areas that are not covered with hair. We have two types of hair that covers our body, our adult body that is, and that is a coarse type of hair. This is what you find in uh, the pubic area, the axillary area, in both males and females, but males have a lot more terminal hair. Males have that terminal hair on their uh, chest, for instance, on their arms and legs as well, while most of us females tend to have a, a much more delicate kind of hair there, which we refer to as vellus. And of course, children mostly have a vellus type of hair. What promotes growth in hair is proper nutrition, obviously. Hormones, as you know very well, it's not until our sex hormones kick in around puberty when we start to grow hair in our axillary region and uh, regions and our pubic region. Anything that increases our blood towards or into our hair follicles, such as massaging or uh, repetitive uh, rubbing or friction, um, is also going to help with hair growth because clearly that is going to bring in the nutrients to the hair follicle and remove the wastes. And don't. And a final thing to add is that cutting is not going to stimulate your hair, right? You're just cutting off a portion of the hair shaft. That's not really going to do anything because that's completely dead. Um, what makes your hair look so nice after you've gone to the hairdressers is, for one, yes, we have removed those hair fo follicles with damaged cuticles, but also our hairdresser has been massaging our scalp, has been brushing and combing and pulling and, and, and um, literally um, promoting much more blood flow to our hair follicles so that they are going to start looking a lot healthier. Now, our hair follicles, they, um, they cycle in between being active and not active, and when they're not active, we say that they are dormant. And those are the times that you might be looking at a slide <clears throat> and there's no hair in the hair follicle. And some areas in our body have long cycles and some of them have short ones. For instance, your eyelashes and your eyebrows tend to have pretty short cycles, which is why those hair follicles are pretty short as well. On the other hand, the hair on your head can grow really, really, really long and so we have very long growth cycles in our hair, on our head. And just as an illustration here, not that I need for you to know any of these details, but this is just for your information. Here you can see how a hair follicle is actively growing, and then it slowly but surely starts to get ready to, or it's already stopped growing, and then it gets ready to uh, be um, removed from the hair follicle and here it actually falls out but notice that a, a new little hair has already begun to uh, start growing here. Just like our hair follicles are made up of keratinocytes that's, that secrete a much harder keratin, so, so do our nails, They're, except that the nails are more scale-like modifications of our epidermis. And of course, they protect our fingers and our toes. And um, just like our hair follicle had a hair matrix, we again have a, a nail matrix where mitotic cell divisions occur, basically the basal layer of the keratinocytes nearby the, um, the dermis. We're just going to take a brief look at the anatomy of nails. So here we have one of our fingers, and this structure here is the little finger bone, which we refer to as the phalanx, plural it would be phalanges with G-E-S at the end. And where 
our um, nail meets the skin on the surface here and underneath we have two spots one is called the eponychium, eponychium meaning on top of and hyponychium below so nico nych typically refers to nail we have the nail body and then the embedded part of the nail we call the nail root and of course nearby where it reaches the dermis that would be referred to as um, the matrix where nail growth occurs. If we look over here on the left hand side we again can see where the skin meets the, the nail on the superficial side and so we call that the eponychium and then this little half moon shaped whitish structure we see at the base of our nail we call the lunula. And so this is really all I need for you guys to know about the nails. We'll move on to the glands in the next video.